Welcome to an unusually belated Stars and Swords. I'm Alistair Stevens. On this week's episode, we conclude our, frankly, all-too-brief discussion of Catherine Kerr's Dagger Spell, the first book in the Devery Cycle. We're going to move through the remainder of the Lothlane plot, then set the stage for the rest of the series while engaging in some dubious politics, and considering what it is to be good, to be virtuous, in the land of Anun. Before we get to that, an update on a point I made in last week's show that was given additional context from a very unexpected direction. As I've mentioned before, the story of the Deverian population of Anun is that a Celtic tribe in Gaul flees the expansion of the Roman Empire by taking to the west. I've always read this as a really interesting bit of fantasy world building, this drawing into the realm of fairy of a mortal population and the adjustment of that population to a new world of magic and fate, even as this land of magic and certainly the pre-existing inhabitants thereof also adjust to these newcomers. And because we're so steeped in Celtic world building in this book, and because the depth of the world building is so ambitious and impressive and comprehensive, I've always interpreted the rest of the book through that lens, from that perspective. What if, I read this world building as asking, what if the Celtic world met fairy? But we are each of us limited in our perspective, and a large part of literary analysis is questioning our underlying assumptions and learning to turn the thing over in our hands, to see it from other angles, to ask about other connections, other interpretive moves that we can make. I bring this up because this week I was reading an old edition of Malorn, the journal of the Tolkien Society, and unexpectedly came upon a very rare, unusual reference to Kerr's work. In Malorn number 33 from 1995, we find a paper entitled Where Do Elves Go To? Tolkien and a Fantasy Tradition by Norman Talbot, a poet and literary theorist and former associate professor at the University of Newcastle in Australia, who I'm afraid to say sadly died in 2004. In this paper, Talbot investigates many then-contemporary fantasy takes on what happens to elves in the ages of men, that is, with the coming of modernity and the retreat of magic. He examines various books, various traditions. Some elves go into the West, some diminish and turn into human beings, some literally diminish in size and become small so they can hide in the cracks of the modern world. It's a really fascinating subject. What surprised me, however, is the detail of his reference to Catherine Kerr's Devery novels. The elves of Anun, quote, had been driven west, of course, into the grasslands by iron-wielding, wain-riding human invaders. Eschewing literacy and, quote, civilization, the elves are in effect pointy-eared plains Indians, fierce and proud, unsurpassed archers and horsemen, with some dwemer. These invaders, destroyed by virulent plagues, have no connection with the mortals now inhabiting Devery, but the Elkian Lakar still prefer to have no truck with, quote, round ears, end quote. So this is interesting, right? We have to, I'm afraid, breeze past the detail that the original elven civilization in Anun was destroyed by a human civilization also originally from Anun. These are the Galdathe, who you'll eventually meet if you keep going with the series. The elves are then again displaced by the incoming Devarians a thousand years before the current time of our story. But what's most interesting here is that I, in my Eurocentric Celtic historical mode, never made the connection with what could absolutely be interpreted as an analogy for Native American peoples. To be clear, it's a slightly disjointed analogy, and Talbot writing 30 years ago is maybe leaning upon some outdated stereotypical depictions of indigenous peoples in North America that we would reject or at least wish to present in a more sophisticated fashion today, but the underlying applicability of the reference is a really interesting one. And all of this, I mention, just to demonstrate how we can be opened up to new perspectives on the text. This is really, in a sense, the purpose of this podcast, of the discussions that we have surrounding these books. Was I right last week when I said the Elki and Lakar are similar to the Romani peoples of Europe? I think so. It, too, is an incomplete analogy, but there's definitely something there. But that doesn't invalidate Talbot's reading of the text or his distillation of this analogy. Neither of us are wholly right, neither of us are wholly wrong, and I'm sure that there are plenty of other valid interpretations too. What matters is where these interpretive moves take you in your understanding of the text, in your ability to make connections and enrich your own experience. Books are not puzzles to be solved. They're landscapes to explore. And that's particularly true of fantasy fiction, which is why we undertook this study with an emphasis on world-building. 
Anyway, that's all I wanted to say by way of catch-up. If you're interested in what Talbot had to say, if you have other ideas about the representation of the elves in Devery, then please do get in touch. Starsandswordspod at gmail.com is the email address, and you can find me on Instagram at starsandswordspod. And I guess since I'm doing this social stuff earlier than usual in the show, I would like to thank listeners Chilsey and a name that I can only pronounce as ah for leaving very lovely reviews on Apple Podcasts, which is the best way of recommending the show to others. If you haven't left yet a review and you have a moment right now while you're listening, I would really appreciate it. Thank you, Cholzy. Thank you. Ah, da-da-da-da-da-da. Yeah, it could be Devarian, I guess. So it could be ah I'm not sure if that's more clear. In any case, let's get back to the book. We've got a long way to go before we're done. We open this week's reading in the aftermath of Jill meeting Nevin, and I admit that though my choice of stopping point for the second reading was a little arbitrary, it worked out really nicely, because we go straight into some relatively complex character work. The first thing to look for is the moment between Cullen and Jill, when he tells her that she'll be writing as a messenger for Rodri's warband, and not, as she would prefer, into combat. He praises her skill with a sword, and she lights up, and when she does, we're given this, quote, The way she smiled in childlike delight wrung his heart. It was at moments like these that Cullen felt an ugly knowledge pressing at the edge of his mind, that maybe he loved his daughter far too well. So what we have previously inferred, and what we have drawn from the accounts that were given from Jill's perspective, has now all but been confirmed. Cullen is still enough of great that not only does he feel this possessive quality for the woman who used to be Brangwen, but he is also somewhat aware of it. And this creates a dramatic irony, too, because we remember that it was when Geraint began to consciously acknowledge his desire that he started making some really bad choices. We're not there yet. He isn't yet articulating his desire. He isn't yet drawing it into his conscious mind, but we can feel the presence of the chasm ahead. Though perhaps there's something to be made of the fact that even now, Cullen is choosing to send Jill away to protect her, which is a choice that Geraint never made, of course. And again, I want to commend Kerr's skill as an author here, the trust that she shows the reader. This sequence operates very effectively in this heightened declarative tone, but rather than follow it through to its conclusion, she steps back. She lets the characters be. She lets the storm clouds speak for themselves. That move is repeated here as we follow Jill into conversation with Nevin, who gets from her not the story of Cullen's dishonor, but rather the story of her childhood. We'll circle back to Cullen's dishonor later in this reading. And we can consider here, too, what this snarl of weird looks like from the outside. Isola was all but ignored by Geraint, unwanted because of his obsession with Brangwen. Then, 50 years and one life later, Kada is devoted to Tanik, but he wants Lyssa. Here, though, we can think of Cullen's words to Jill early in the book while visiting Serian's grave. Quote, Farewell, my love, he whispered. For all my wandering, I never loved a woman but you, and I pray to every god you believed me when I told you that. He stood up and wiped the dagger blade clean on the side of his brigga. That's all the mourning you'll ever see me do, Jill. But remember how I loved your mother. End quote. So Surian and Cullen didn't get to be together any more than Isola and Geraint did, but there's clearly a different emotional aspect to this version of their relationship. And I'm emphasizing this for two reasons. Firstly, because we should be aware that weird, for all that it is personal, seems to operate on an internal sense of justice, of not just the balancing of good and bad, but the personal repayment of debt. Isola is badly used by Grant Kada, is badly used by Tanik, but in this life seems to have had his love and his fidelity. But there's a limit, because she's still not going to get her happy ever after, which leads me to the second reason that I want to emphasize this small moment, which is the balancing of personal debts being overshadowed by larger concerns in the present. As Nevin and Adarin ride out to practice their arts and scry on Lothlane's encampment, they discuss the political situation on the western border of Devery. Adarin says, quote, You know as well as I do that without human dwarmer on the border there'll be open war between man and elf. So I do. Well, I'm going to do my best to convince your successor that she should take up the dwarmer. And is that our Jill's word? I'm not certain, of course, but I'm beginning to think so. First, she'll have to be firmly rooted in the ways of her own kind, and that's my task. And then, well, the Lords of Light will give her omens when the time is ripe. Just so, but that's a long way away, and the Elki and Lakar need me there now. End quote. Without human Dwemer on the border, there'll be open war. 
So Adarin has been working for peace all this time, and the pursuit of peace isn't just diplomatic, but it's also magical? Or at least that he's using the Dwemer to pursue diplomatic ends? How so? Well, let's unpack what we know. Obviously, there is conflict between the human and elven populations in this part of the world. The West folk are more openly hostile, perhaps, and certainly more overtly critical of humans. Based on their history, we'll note that the men of Dregeth's caravan and of Rodri's warband come to that know very little about the West folk, and what conflict there is seems to be rooted in their distrust of the magic, of the alien. After a thousand years of shared history, the Devarians still recognize that the elves are something other. So the risk of war in Eldith may be a product of incompatible philosophies, incompatible essences almost, but certainly of worldviews, but the possibility of warfare is being managed and mediated by a human being with access to the Dwemer. So the elves don't trust the humans because of what they've done, the humans don't trust the elves because of what they are. Which is why, of course, Adarin must work for peace on the elven side of the border, because even the power that he uses to advance the cause of peace would be viewed with suspicion or outright hostility in his own lands. It's a fascinating political conundrum. We'll circle back, too, to the use of Dwomer in Devery in pages to come. And there's a level here to the world building that I find really interesting. We discussed last week Tyrion Lovian's acknowledgement of the Dwemer and her privileging of Nevin's position in her household. So, on the one hand, there is this constant suspicion and fear about magic and the wild folk and fairies and elves. They're almost axiomatically necessary to our understanding of medieval Celtic society. One of the things which defines a medieval Celtic society is a fear, suspicion, distrust of these supernatural elements. But Kerr has situated that society in a world where those magical forces are not only real, are not only true, but we might argue are uniquely situated in this specific place. So for a thousand years, we've seen a defiant disbelief in Devery, a rejection of what is inarguably true about this place. And I'm drawing out the comparison with the real world here in which rational skepticism is seen as the path out of the Middle Ages into the glorious illumination of the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. But again, we have no desire to educate within the pages of this book. It isn't Nevin's job to go and convince each individual Tyrion and Gwerbert in Devery, not even the High King himself. He takes action in front of Rhys at the end of the novel, only at the specific request of Lovian, and even then his demonstration is one of power, but not, crucially, one of understanding. He doesn't try to explain the Dwemer, he just puts on a pyrotechnic display. And that's the rare exception, because usually he works with subtlety to advance individual causes. And we can read this as a preoccupation with his own weird, perhaps with the promise that he made to Brangwen's spirit 400 years before. But note how Nevin slots Jill into the ongoing work of peace on the border, referring to her as Adarin's successor. And is that our Jill's weird? asks Adarin, and Nevin says, uh, yeah, kinda. So Jill's weird isn't just about being brought to the Dwemer, which is what we've suspected up until this point, but also to act as Warden of the West? Indeed, not just to preserve the peace, because much later, after Rodri's elven blood is revealed, Adarin will say, quote, When the time comes for the reconciliation of elves and men, it would be useful to have him Tyrion on the western border. End quote. So we aren't just maintaining a separate peace, but when the time comes, we're looking ahead to a more formal friendship between the two peoples. All of this confirms what we've intuited because we've, you know, read stories before. The lords of Weird and each individual destiny are building collectively towards something, towards some kind of universal value. Your individual Weird might be leading you to death, heroic, perhaps, like that presumably awaiting Cullen, or mundane and tragic, like Jill's mother, Serian. But peace is a good thing, capital G, capital T. We've seen enough of the debts owed and paid by souls in new bodies to confidently assert that there's also a sense of justice at play here, of rightness. Indeed, even the idea of a debt is predicated on the idea of an underlying fairness, an underlying justice. We can also possibly expand this to encompass the notion of social order itself. And though in the real world we might look at the feudal system as something pretty damn iniquitous, we have to remember that in Devery the divine right of kings is actually literally true. So social order is clearly important to the lords of Weird who stand behind all the gods. <laughs>
Let's put a pin in this and move on for now, not least of all because we're about to get some illustrative examples of both the light and the shadow. Nevin scries out Lothlain, and we get the most detailed description that we've had thus far of the etheric plane and how it works. When detached from his physical body, his awareness travels to the dome of pale silver light that Lothlain has erected to conceal Corbin's army, sealed with pentagrams dedicated to the different elemental kings. Nevin invokes the title of the king, and the pentagram moves aside. Lothlain's power, we see, is not his own, but is borrowed from the elemental planes. As we've seen, the spirits of these planes have personalities all their own, from the unseen kings down to the individual wild folk themselves. The other thing to note here are the ways in which auras are represented, color-coded for your convenience. The bright red auras of warriors, of killers, though what exactly that means in this context is unclear, are contrasted with Adarin's soft golden glow and Lothlane's shifting, pulsating mass of color, quote, that changed as Nevin watched from gold to sickly olive green, end quote. So Lothlane's aura is changing color, it's changing size, it is inconstant. And that is all the proof that Nevin needs to diagnose Lothlane as, quote, mad, stark, raving, mad, end quote. And we can tie that back, too, to our questions about higher virtues. Again, things which are good are steady and solid and unchanging and dignified. Things which are bad are inconstant, ever-changing, unpredictable, dangerous. I'll note the revelation here that Lothlane is Adarin's son, which I'm certain most readers have already guessed by now. And then we're going to skip ahead, though... Not too far, because we do have to highlight the arrival of Jill at Duncanabane, where Tiran Lovian, who we remember holds power here in her own right, something very unusual in Devery, offers Jill a place in her retinue should anything happen to Cullen. Quote, Jill started shaking, a little tremor of her whole body. Your grace is truly the most generous lord I've ever met. If ever you have need of my sword, then it's at your disposal. It was such a masculine way of thanking someone that Lovian nearly laughed. Well, let's pray things never come to that but you have my thanks, end quote. It's no coincidence that we're seeing here two women in masculine modes. We don't have enough information to be sure of the formal mode of address here, but it is clearly striking on the page that Jill refers to Lovian as a lord rather than a lady. What's really interesting here, though, as I kind of hinted at last week, is that for all of the emphasis we put on social order in Devery, the rules are much less important than one's individual weird. Lovian is surprised to discover that Jill is a woman, but isn't crucially scandalized. Jill has no problem pledging her sword to the Tyrion, regardless of the fact that the Tyrion is also a woman. Again, we get the sense that good people rise to authority over others, but part of their goodness is being somewhat less invested in the very strict rules of social convention, even as they benefit from them. We'll see this again in the very next scene as we cut out to Rodri and Cullen talking on the eve of battle, and Rodri offering Cullen the honor of riding beside him and of eating with him. Cullen protests that he's a dishonored man, but Rodri respects him regardless, indirectly echoing his mother. And, you know, it might be fair to say that I am drawing insupportable conclusions based on limited evidence here. We don't know how the other lords of Devery behave, after all. But protagonism is a special kind of narrative privilege in and of itself. We could build an argument that if other nobles of Devery were more important than Lovian and Rodri, then the story would be about them instead. The fact that these characters are who these characters are tells us that whatever the author wants to say is being said by them, where we can hear them right on the page. So the things that are presented as being the most important things in Devery, gender, social class, honor, and dishonor, these things give a very specific shape to society. They are absolutely necessary as instruments of social order, and they are crucially, casually set aside by the narratively empowered protagonists of the book. I find that fascinating, and I'm inclined to read it as an example of the protagonist class as being more liberated and more modern, more progressive in their views. But there's no sense, I think, that Lovian or Rodri, when he holds the title, would ever actually work to change things. Even they love the status quo, which is perhaps an easier thing to do when A, it specifically benefits you and yours, and B, you can set it aside whenever you like, because mostly it doesn't apply to you. We'll see this again later in the book when Rodri appoints Cullen as captain of his warband and assures him that no one is going to have a problem with the silver dagger holding a position of authority 
partly because Cullen has proved himself on the field and won the personal loyalty of the surviving man, the personal, again, overcoming the societal there, but also because Rodri is effectively lending Cullen his ability to break the rules. And we might argue that there's something fundamentally hypocritical here, that this is an extension of that divine right of kings notion, that if the lords of Weird decide that you are to be born noble, then you get the benefits of this established social order, but none of the obligations. But we should be careful here to disentangle, to separate and distinguish our protagonists from the other nobles of Devery, people like Sligan, for example, who do seem to be more bound, more constrained by expected behavior. Could Rhys appoint Cullen to his warband without other men whispering and grumbling? Well, probably not, right? It doesn't feel intuitively true. We see the other nobles of the kingdom tied by honor and obligation far more than Rodri Melwaith or his mother. So what, we might wonder, is underpinning that action, is underpinning this story? More on that later. We move through the battle and the concerted effort of Corbin's men to kill Rodri, and by saving him, Cullen goes some way to undoing the damage done by Geraint. From there, we move to the second engagement. Cullen is critically injured, and Jill witnesses this event remotely through a vision of the battle. And then Kerr plays the classics with Lothlane's prophecy that Lord Corbin will never be slain by a man's hand. But what could it mean? Codified by Shakespeare, and then perfected by Tolkien, who was unimpressed with the prophecy element in Macbeth, this kind of loophole prophecy is genuinely ancient. Greek myth is replete with examples. Egyptian myth has its own version too. Loki loves playing out mischievous versions of this in Norse myth. Spencer's The Fairy Queen uses a version. The oldest known version of a woman killing someone that no man can kill comes from Hinduism and the story of Mahishasura and Durga from around 3,000 years ago. The twist in this book that Rodri and young Amir are smart enough to immediately figure it out is actually a really strong move, I think, from Kerr. It's the thread that binds together the last movement of the rebellion plot, not just the presence of the prophecy itself, but the exploitation of the obvious loophole that forces Jill and Rodri together and gives them the opportunity to kindle their romance. A romance which is, of course, as personally dangerous to each of them as Corbin's rebellion ever was. Quote, Oh, they always say every Dwemer prophecies like a sword blade. Jill held hers up flat in illustration. It's sharp on both sides. End quote. It certainly is. It's pointing us, I think, towards something very important about the people of Devry and about the world of Daggerspell. They are familiar with stories. Part of their relocation to fairy has involved the literalization of the narrative beats of their own myths, their own fairy tales. We'll circle back to this point at the end of this session because I think it's maybe the most important thing about the world building underpinning this novel. But for now, let's note how sophisticated Rodri and the others are at parsing the details of this prophecy and understanding how to unpick it. They understand the rules of a story, a prophecy in this case. They understand that the rules are firm, but they also understand that there are gaps in which you can discover or assert even your own understanding, your own interpretation, your own comprehension. Okay, we'll hold the rest of that until later, though we'll stick with prophecy for now, kind of, and skip ahead a little to Adarin and Nevin talking about their unseen foe, the dark Duomer master, who is now evidently targeting Rodri. Quote, and why does the dark master want Rodri dead? I don't know. Nevin allowed himself a grim smile. There he has the advantage of us. It's the dark dwemer that's always brooding about word in the future, not men like us who have the light to trust in. I've been content to wait for more omens from the great ones about Rodri's weird, and let them reveal it to me in their own good time. I'll wager our enemy's been brooding and prying into closed things, and that he has a very good reason to want Rodri out of the way. Whatever it is, it bodes ill for Eldath. End quote. It's the dark dwemer that's always brooding about word and the future, only a Sith deals in absolutes. I must confess at this point, I don't care very much for the way that the Dark Dwemer, the every light casts a shadow concept, is introduced in this book and presented as a counterpoint to what Nevin and Adarin are doing. In fairness, it is to some extent going to be developed into something more interesting as we move forward through the series, and it's indistinct enough in this book that we never really allow it to get in the way. And certainly when we see the practice of Dark Dwemer, we see something more twisted and personal and unwell than we might expect from paragraphs like this. So let's move past the irony of Nevin, Nevin of all people, complaining about people brooding about weird, and do instead some close reading. 
The Dark Dwemer broods about weird and the future, not men like us who have the light to trust in. So, do we trust the light because we are card-carrying good guys and we know everything is going to be okay? No, but rather because the light here, I think, is less metaphorical than the comparison with the dark would suggest. It's really light. It illuminates. They don't need to go hunting for clues because they can see more clearly. They receive omens. What they need to know is revealed. Which is fine if you trust in this metaphysical hierarchy, if you believe that the Lords of Weird will tell you what you need to know in order to play your part and accomplish good things. But believing this, as in the mundane social hierarchy of the Kingdom of Nevery, is not only a necessary part of being a good person, but is perhaps the thing which distinguishes the good Dwemer Master from the bad. The dark Dwemer Master, by contrast, is brooding and prying into closed things. Are those things closed by the Great Ones? By the same beings of light that Nevin trusts to guide him? Are there other powers? Dark Ones who operate at a similar metaphysical level to the residents of the Halls of Light, to whom the Dark Dwemer is a tool? Well, I don't think so. Not, anyway, at the same metaphysical level. I think we can be pretty certain of that from the basic metaphor, that the Dwemer is the light and the Dark Dwemer is the shadow that is cast. What we've seen of Lothlain and of his Unseen Master tells us that darkness breeds in darkness, that the malign influence has spread through deception and disguise, the voice in Lothlane's head, the ensorcelment of Corbin's allies and vassals, for example. And most crucially, the Dark Dwemer thrives in secrecy. It sneaks and conspires and flees when confronted because the shadow, definitively, elementally, cannot defeat the light. All of which is good, and properly situates the Dark Dwemer in its context as an antagonist to the Light, which is to say that it is a dangerous, destabilizing force, but it's not, I think, a fundamental metaphysical clash between two equal forces. This isn't good and evil. Under normal circumstances, Dwemer Masters work to help people in the pursuit of their own weird, individually and en masse. They represent and encourage the kind of wisdom and self-awareness we've discussed before. They're working for peace on the border with the Westfolk. They're watching Rodri and Jill and the next cycle of these souls. And fundamentally, and this is probably about as far as we can take this argument, I think, fundamentally the Dark Dwemer in the series runs into a conceptual problem, which is that it's difficult, if not impossible, to sufficiently define and empower the opposite of wisdom. If the primary virtue in your next fantasy novel is, let's say, personal freedom, right, then it's pretty easy to create the philosophical antithesis of that, a strong dictatorial authority, the empire to your rebellion. If your primary virtue is social responsibility, then you can absolutely populate your novel with libertarian billionaires to provide antagonism and conceptual crunch. But the opposite of wisdom and self-awareness, those things for which we are striving in the land of Devery, is ignorance, insensibility. It's tough to embody those qualities in a strong, effective antagonist, which is why I think the Dark Dwemer doesn't quite connect to the underlying metaphysics of this novel. Luckily, we don't have to deal with it much longer in this book. As we move through the back part of the novel, we're building the presence of the Dark Master of the Dwemer, but we resolve it pretty quickly when Nevin meets with his apprentice on the etheric plane and we witness his death. Liberated from the control of his master, Lothlane realizes how long he has been ensorcelled. We get the great moment where wisdom returns all at once, and Lothlane realizes that there is now no hope of victory. The bitter pill of awareness is the knowledge that his scheme has fallen apart. This is also where we confirm the minor detail of Lothlane's backstory, that he fled the West Folk after murdering an elf in order to take his scrying stone. And there's some really interesting restraint here from Kerr. The Scrying Stone is essential to Lothlane's plot, in that the desire of it first drives him to kill and then physically takes him into the human lands of Eldeth, where the dark voice comes to him. It is also, we're told by the prisoner that Rodri captured, the means by which Lothlane arrives at his prophecy regarding Corbin. The only other reference to Scrying Stones, beside a joke from Lord Sligan later in the chapter, is in the very next scene after Nevin has defeated the Dark Apprentice and Lothlane comes to his senses, where we note that, quote, in his mind, he held the image of a six-pointed star, a red triangle and a blue intertwined, and used it the way a clumsier Dwemer man would have used a scrying stone. End quote. Well, damn, not only is the scrying stone not very important, it is also the crutch of an unskilled Dwemerman. This systematic disempowerment of Lothlane 
is an odd choice, except, I suppose, if we're adopting the Socratic perspective I mentioned in our first session, that evil is only ever the product of ignorance and never of real power, though that ties in too to the conceptual imbalance between the light and the dark as it's presented in this book. Rodri and his warband catch up with the men that Corbin had left behind, and Rodri demonstrates here his nobility in both the formal and informal senses, I suppose, by stopping to help. In this way, we confirm his obedience to the expectation of his society shortly before we reveal his heritage, which we do first through Genentar and Calendarial, who speculate to Jill about Rodri's bloodline. Rodri comes to Jill's tent, is assaulted by her gnome, whom he cannot see, which again distinguishes him from the West Folk, and then, with the reveal that Jill's dwarven steel silver dagger glows when Rodri holds it, his heritage is all but confirmed. Adarin supplies this dissatisfying shrug of an explanation, but we will jump the timeline here to Nevin's scene in the next chapter with Lovian, who immediately confesses that Rodri's father was not her husband. Tingir had taken a mistress, we learn, and Lovian had gone to Dungorban to visit with her brother and had a brief relationship there with an elven bard, who, it turns out, is Rodri's real father. If you're interested, we will meet that self-same elf, Deva Burial Silverhand, in the second book of the series. What's most interesting about this reveal, I think, besides its function as another example of Lovian disregarding the actual laws of her own land and the conventions of her own society in order to pursue her own personal agenda, specifically here that Rodri will rule in the West after her, despite not being a part of the line of succession. Besides that, all that the reveal about Rodri's parentage really accomplishes is to provide him with a connection to the West, beyond the borders of Aldith. Genentar and Calendarial tell Jill that Rodri is just too fast, too skilled with a sword to be human, and we've noted throughout the book his particularly sharp eyesight. But these qualities aren't exactly superpowers. He has an advantage over other humans, perhaps, but it's not a large one. It does connect him with the magic of Anun. It leaves him with a foot in both worlds, and that, I think, is the key, because the real consequence of this reveal is that he is simply more like Jill, who, for all of her human blood, can see the wild folk and has Dwemer visions. She occupies both worlds, and now we understand that Rodri does too. But enough foreshadowing of the rest of the series. We still have battles to fight and wars to win in both the external and internal senses. We come to a long-anticipated crisis point when Nevin tends Cullen's injuries and discovers, as Cullen rages about Jill riding off to battle with Rodri, that his wound is infected and is faced with the possibility of letting Cullen die before he can wreak havoc and vengeance, repeating the cycle of violence and obsession. But Nevin makes the right choice. He gives this man the chance to prove himself, to overcome his desires, and to follow his own weird. Judicious wisdom doesn't just allow us to connect with our own weird but to help others find their way too. When Adarin, Jill, Genitar, and Calendariel finally launch their assault on Lothlane, we get the interesting detail that Silver can be used against him because if he is killed with Silver, the shape-shifting Dwemer that he has employed to transform himself into a hawk will be undone. The Silver of Jill's dagger will, therefore, reveal the truth of Lothlane just as it revealed the truth of Rodri which makes strong magical sense, even if it does shift our understanding of what Jill's dagger really is. It's not steel, okay, but it's also not actually silver, unlike the arrowheads used by Genitar during the fight. But regardless of the actual metallurgical makeup, it is metaphorically silver, and thus works in the tradition of silver bullets defeating werewolves, or in some traditions, vampires. Silver is also, of course, mythologically connected to purity, which accounts for its reputed ability to detect poison, and with fairy, as in the story of the Silver Bow. This sense of purity and of purging, however, maybe casts a shadow on Adarin's own physical transformation into an owl. If this is a thing which virtue can undo then it carries some of the texture or quality of vice, perhaps. It might make more sense then, assuming that we as readers are perfectly happy with Adarin turning into an owl and do not see this as an immoral act, to consider Silver's historical association with mirrors and reflectivity. Thus, we are using Silver here to reveal the truth without judgment. Adarin then brings the hawk that is his son down to earth, where Jill can stab him with her dagger, and Genitar delivers the killing blow with the silver arrow. His body is returned to Lord Corbin as proof of his imminent defeat, forcing Corbin to sally forth from the dun and eventually to face Jill on the field of battle. She is, as was foretold, victorious, and with the war over, Rodri and his warband settle in to rest and feast. There, we pick up with Jill again. Quote, 
Every man in the hall cheered as Jill made her way to him. God touched. She supposed that was how they had to see her, a favourite of some god or other, rather than admitting she was merely a woman who could fight as well as a man. End quote. And this is such a great passage, both for how accurate it is, how perceptive that Jill is right, and it's easier for these men, who had to be so thoroughly convinced of the existence of Dwomer and its role in Corbin's rebellion, to now so readily believe that a magical force guides Jill's sword during a fight. But it's also endearingly inaccurate, demonstrating to us that Jill still has a long way to go in search of her own weird, because she isn't merely a woman who could fight as well as a man. She is the daughter of Cullen of Caramore. She lived a life that we can be fairly confident no other woman has ever lived in the history of Devery. She is the product of all her past lives, and she belongs to that special class of protagonists which we discussed earlier. Jill is many things, but Jill is not normal. In this way, we can see that she is still lacking wisdom, lacking perspective, something that's going to be immediately significant when, empowered by her victory and feeling reckless, Jill goes to Rodri and they sleep together, setting the stage for the final part of the book, Chapter 6, Aldith, 1062. The warband returns home victorious, and Jill races to see her father, who is recovering from the broken arm that he suffered earlier. And it all comes down to this. Quote, Well and good, then. I suppose you had to see for yourself and learn the hard way. You're too much like me to learn any other way. When she laughed, he bent his head to kiss her then realized that Nevin was standing in the open doorway and watching them with an oddly frightened expression, quickly stifled. Cullen let go of Jill and moved away. The old man's stare was a mirror, making him see an ugly, twisted thing that he'd hidden from himself until that moment. End quote. Again, mirrors revealing the truth. There are incremental shifts through the last chapter of the book as Cullen comes to terms with his desire for Jill, but this is the moment in which he is most tempted. He makes the decision immediately to leave and to never return, knowing that he can justify the choice to himself because no matter how much Jill hurts now, she'll be saved the pain of his eventual death on the long road. And there's a pleasing synchrony to how all of this unfolds, that it's Nevin's presence in the corridor that makes Cullen realize what is happening, and then Rodri's desire for him to become the new captain of his warband that makes him stay and actually resolve these feelings, not just leaving a debt and a conflict for their next lives, not kicking the can of responsibility down the reincarnation road. At the end of the scene, Cullen weeps with shame for almost harming Jill. Quote, he turned his face to the pillow and wept for the first time since he'd lain on Syrian's grave, and this time too he was weeping for her and for their daughter. End quote. Everyone is now present. All the souls who were entangled back in that first incarnation are now here, even if only in memory. We've reunited them. All the souls ensnared by Galrian selfishness and Geraint's dark desire. Cullen faces his test, and this time he passes. This time he lets Branglin go. Not that it's an easy path, exactly. Jill is understandably upset at being traded from her father to Rodri, like, as she notes, a horse, so that she can be Rodri's mistress even if she can never be his wife. And we might well speculate that Jill would be poorly suited to that life, and we may also protest that at this point in the novel, Jill is being pretty thoroughly sidelined, that the men are taking over. This is, in part a product of the way that power is held and exercised in the kingdom of Devery. This is a product of the feudalistic world building, but it's also a product of the fact that a lot of what Jill is and wants is somewhat informed. I don't really remember the experience of reading this book for the first time, so I don't know how well the romance between Rodri and Jill worked for me then. It works well enough for me now, but I'm remembering books to come. In this reading, I must admit, I found it a little thin. We don't really see them fall in love or seduce each other or even really feel any attraction to each other until all at once they are completely caught up in one another with no alternative. The exception to this, as I noted earlier, is Jill going to Rodri after the feast and claiming her prize for victory over Corbin, which is immediately motivated, it's vivid, and even if we're worried about the consequences, it is something I think that we can support in that moment, even if it is just Jill acting out against that misogynistic culture. The real plot of this last chapter, however, begins when Rhys demands that Rodri and everyone involved in the putting down of Corbin's rebellion come to Aberwyn to receive judgment. Before we leave, there is the final matter of Cullen's detangling of Geraint's weird. We learn that his dishonor came from killing another member of the Gwerbert's warband over the affections of Sarian, though Cullen only acted in the defense of the woman he loved. But more than that, he now has earned sufficient wisdom, sufficient self-awareness, 
to give up Jill. Quote, So you see, I swore then that I'd never kill another man over a woman. It doesn't do you or her one cursed bit of good. Nevin was speechless for a moment, simply because Cullen had no idea of just how much of his word he was laying aside with that simple truth. You learn, Cullen said. I was a stubborn young dog, but you learn. End quote. So, as we've been discussing throughout the series, Cullen exemplifies this path both to your own weird and the path to resolving the sins of the past. Wisdom, humility, honesty, and courage. Let's move then to the last major event of the novel and Reese taunting Rodri into drawing his sword in the Gwerberts Hall. It's simultaneously fascinating and somewhat hollow, I think, that there's no greater depth to the enmity between these brothers. As Nevin himself observes, it's just one of those things that happens between siblings, though in a broader sense, we might wonder if all of the sins of the past which haunt these characters begin in simple, pointless human conflicts like this one. One crucial clarification here, because I often see this misread in interpretations of this book, Rhys gives Cullen and Nevin his sworn word that he won't harm Rodri, which is as good a promise as you could want. It's important to note, though, that though Cullen tells Rodri what Rhys was planning, he doesn't tell him about the sworn word. This means that when Rodri defies his brother, he doesn't do it from a position of security. He's not grandstanding. He is not making a point from a position of safety. Rather, this is a sincere defiance. This is a refusal to beg on his knees for his brother's protection, even if it means his death. And if Rodri's defiance is at least easier for us to understand than Reese's malevolence, we are forced to comprehend that they are both acting from selfishness, from ignorance, that they are not acting in the best interests of the kingdom, they are not following their weird. It's a very different kind of conflict than the one which started this novel, but it's of a similarly intractable sort. Here we get the interesting reversal too of the way in which the law can be set aside in order to do what we want if we are sufficiently special. Rhys allows himself to be reminded by Cullen that he gave his word. He takes the opportunity to have Rodri exiled rather than killed. That's if we believe his later account of his actions to his mother, because in the moment, the narrative voice is much more clear on his desire for bloodshed. The scene where Cullen gives Rodri his silver dagger is also particularly interesting, not just because I really enjoy the interaction of these two men now that they've freed themselves from the burdens of the past, but because it clarifies a detail that remained obstinately unclear, I think, up to this point. Silver daggers aren't just mercenaries in Devery. They're the only mercenaries in Devery, presumably the only ones allowed by law. Certainly, Cullen makes it clear here that Rodri won't be able to make a living by his sword as a dishonored man unless he takes the dagger, which is, of course, a strange kind of fate, since the same dagger will reveal Rodri to be half-elven if he ever touches it. So on the one hand, we're freeing Rodri from his position in society so that he can take to the long road with Jill, so she can have the kind of life that she wants to have. She can be free, she can be independent, she can practice her skills, and she can be, crucially, with a man of her own rank without feeling inferior to anyone. This is what takes the sting out of the sidelining of Jill as a protagonist between Lord Corbin's Hall and Rodri's exile. Honestly, it's clear that a lot of this maneuvering is taking place in service of her plot, even when she is not present. Quote, Jill felt like singing. She wondered what was wrong with her, that she'd feel nothing but joy. Then she realized she should have known all along from that first horrible moment when Rodri got to his feet in the Chamber of Justice, the door to her cage was standing open if she had the courage to fly. End quote. Rodri flees to the village near Abernath and is saved from Reese's men by the wild folk, bringing him even closer, of course, to Jill's experience of the world, making him a better romantic match. Then he and Jill are reunited in the tavern, and shortly thereafter, Nevin stops in too, musing, one might even say brooding, on his weird. Quote, Rodri's voice went cold and flat. In every battle I rode, I would have been volunteering for the point of the charge, or riding into the worst mob. There's more than one way for a man to end his exile. It was a confession, quietly sad. Jill grabbed his arm. But not now, he went on. Not when I've got you to live for. Jill flung her arms around his neck and kissed him. Nevin sighed aloud at the irony of it, that by keeping Rodri alive, Jill was already serving the Dwarmer, though she knew it not. End quote. And that, with our new status quo, the looming threat of the Dark Dwarmer, the mystery of Rodri's weird that is Eldith's weird, and the possibility of Rhys recalling his exiled little brother, 
we have everything we need for the story to continue into the second book. And it's a strong ending for all that it's looking ahead. We have been working toward this ending since the very first page. We've resolved so many of the debts and conflicts established in our first flashback and compounded in the second, most notably, of course, Geraint and Blaine, but we can also speculate about Isola. Brangwen's fate is still up for grabs, though as Nevin notes, she's already working for the Dwemer and is perhaps exactly where she needs to be, and if she isn't quite restored to protagonistic primacy here at the end of the novel, she is at least not too far from it. And that, friends, is Daggerspell. Save for one last thought, which... I think it's going to go a long way to unite many of the strands we've discussed in this episode and throughout this very brief series. This is a book in which we have two strong sets of moral obligations. One legal, secular, belonging to the kingdom, obey those above you, care for those beneath you, conduct yourself with honor, play your part. The other is metaphysical. It's partly magical, it's partly divine. Learn and be aware, find wisdom and embrace your weird, accept it and trust that it is for the best, be who you are, and do what you are meant to do. These two moral schemata are, in theory at least, compatible, though not necessarily perfectly so. They're also categorically rejected by our characters, who are filled repeatedly with pride and lust and wrath, and for whom those deadly sins are often actually virtues. The book is not unhappy that Jill and Rodri have sex. Quite the contrary, I think. The book is not unhappy that Lovian has a relationship with an elf despite being married, or that Rodri defies his brother in his own hall. We set aside both law and weird repeatedly. And more often than not, the book celebrates the characters who do so. More than that, even, by either measure, by law or weird, what happens to Jill and Rodri in this book can only be considered a failure, a borderline disaster. So we return to the earlier question. What does this book believe to be good? It's justice, I think, of a sort. It's something like honor and pride, though those things have been turned to ill consequence too. But justice, catharsis, emotional resolution, this is what matters in Devery. And that, I think, is for a single reason in two different ways. That Devery is, as seen from both within and without, a place where stories happen. I mentioned all the way back when we were discussing The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe back in the first series of this podcast that I am pretty exhausted by stories in which stories are themselves the point. But Devery, crucially, interrogates this idea from those two different directions simultaneously. Externally, of course, it is a novel, it is a series, it is a story. But internally, as these characters inherit bonds and conflicts and obligations and connections, debts and desires which are their own but are not of their own making, as souls move from life to life, making good on the mistakes of the past and making whole new mistakes to keep the cycle going, within the fiction of Devery, these characters are inhabiting the roles of other characters. Cullen, who is Tannic, who is Geraint, who sets aside his desire and honors his friend Blaine, who also forgives Gweren the Bard, who had put him to death just as Rodri, who was Gweren, who was Blaine, also draws a sword in the Gwerbret's Hall and faces the same fate as Tannic did. Because of the structure of this novel, and certainly because of the structure of the series as a whole, Daggerspell is its own intertext. It is its own metatext. It gets to be a story about stories because it really actually is a story about stories, about unfinished arcs and tragic ends and final, long-awaited happy ever afters. It's about narrative justice, and that, I think, is the virtue which exceeds all others in the world of Devery. The true weird that isn't all about cool analytical wisdom and divesting oneself of immediate desire. It is about satisfaction. It is about completion. It is about culmination. It's the story that ends the way the story should end. That, to me, is what makes Daggerspell so special, and why Eldith's fate in the balance or not, Nevin's promise unfulfilled or not. I can't be mad at Jill and Rodri riding off together. Sometimes stories aren't wise, they're not safe, they aren't prudent, they aren't judicious. Sometimes all we want, all we need, is for a story to be satisfying. Before we conclude then, a quick note about our schedule for the next book that we're going to cover here on Stars and Swords, Charles Dickens' Great Expectations. 
This is a longer read than Dagger Spell. It's a longer read than any book that we have covered so far on the podcast. So we are going to take six weeks in total to cover this book, including a short introductory session next week. Then we'll cover the first 10 chapters, roughly the first fifth of the book, the following week. And one other announcement, this time about the bonus episode attached to the Dagger Spell series. I was talking on a recent Patreon bonus episode about being somewhat bereft of ideas about an appropriately Celtic fantasy book or movie to cover as an adjacent text, and I am indebted to the very wonderful Leslie Skipa for suggesting The Black Cauldron, the 1985 Disney film which loosely adapts Lloyd Alexander's The Chronicles of Prydain. It was, at the time, the most expensive animated film ever made, and it was such a commercial failure that it earned a reputation as the film that almost killed Disney. It's also extremely short. It's only 80 minutes, including credits. So stay tuned over the next couple of weeks for a bonus episode looking at that film, looking a little at the Prydain series in general, and a little at the challenges associated with adapting fantasy fiction into movies. If you'd like to hear that bonus episode, as well as all the other Next Word bonus episodes, then patreon.com slash next word is your magical portal into a fantasy world of more podcast episodes, which, let's face it, is what we all really want. That is going to do it for this week. That's going to do it for Dagger Spell. That's going to do it for now, at least for Catherine Kerr. It has been an absolute pleasure to explore this book and to look at the ways in which it is in conversation with real history, in conversation with the then contemporary landscape of fantasy fiction, and most importantly, in conversation with itself. I, for one, will be reading through the rest of at least the first act of the Devery Cycle over the next few months, not least of all because I got an audiobook bundle, which includes the first four books. So if you follow along on that undocumented journey, please get in touch and let me know what you think. And on that note, and as always, the long road stretches into mist, Cullen always said, and no one can see the end of it. She had Rodri and her freedom to ride. As she fell back to sleep, she decided that they would do splendidly for now. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.